The destroyer has long been the workhorse of modern navies. The newest and most sophisticated version of this warship is the U.S. Navy's Burke-class destroyer. With its advanced weapons platform and state-of-the-art radar systems, these ships are poised to dominate the seas for decades to come. Fierce naval clashes of battleship against battleship are an iconic image of past wars. Today, the U.S. Navy's fleet of nuclear carriers hold the front line during combat at sea. While the carriers get most of the attention in contemporary warfare, it is the destroyers that form the backbone of the modern fleet. In today's Navy, there are three types of surface warships the frigate, the destroyer, and the cruiser. The smallest and most economical of the three is the frigate. They carry fewer weapons and less sophisticated electronic sensors than the larger destroyers and cruisers. On the high end of the scale are the cruisers, such as the US Navy's Ticonderoga-class Aegis cruisers. The Aegis-class cruisers are especially well-suited to defending carrier battle groups against air attack, often called the shield of the fleet. Cruisers are larger than destroyers since they contain additional command and control facilities aboard to allow senior naval officers to coordinate the actions of other ships in a battle group. The destroyer fits in between the frigate and the cruiser. The modern destroyer is a well-balanced design. It is capable of carrying out a wider range of missions than frigates, while at the same time carrying weapons that give it capabilities approaching those of cruisers. The name destroyer stems from this ship's traditional role, torpedo boat destroyer. Today the small torpedo boat is no longer a significant threat to surface warships. Other types of vessels have replaced it. The most deadly torpedo boat today is the submarine. And destroyers like the R. Lee Burke are designed to combat the undersea threat. Above the surface, the anti-ship missile has replaced the torpedo as the newest danger. This requires a change in the balance of weapons carried by modern destroyers. These trends are most evident in the U.S. Navy's newest class of destroyers, the DDG-51 Arleigh Burks. These destroyers are named in honor of Admiral Arleigh Burke, a legendary World War II destroyer commander. During the fighting in the Pacific, Burke commanded Destroyer Squadron 23 and won several key naval engagements with the Japanese fleets, including the Battle of Cape St. George in November 1943. Burke went on to play a prominent role in shaping the post-war U.S. Navy. Commissioned on July 4th, 1991, the DDG-51 R. Lee Burke was the first ship in a new class of destroyers. Among the ships in this class is the DDG-67 USS Cole, which was brought to the world's attention in October of 2000 when it was attacked by terrorists and 17 sailors were killed. Though their missions remain much the same, the ships of the Burke class are dramatically different from the destroyers Admiral Burke commanded in World War II. They are more than four times heavier than a World War II destroyer, with the latest version displacing over 9,000 tons. These destroyers represent many new approaches in naval ship design, even compared to destroyers from only a decade earlier. One of the most striking changes from earlier destroyer designs is its hull shape. 
Destroyers have traditionally been long and narrow. The Burke's designers took another approach. We have a very unique relationship uh, in naval architectural terms, which is our length to beam ratio. For a, a ship of our length, we're very, very wide in the beam. And what that translates to is enhanced stability. We may not be the fastest ship on the ocean in a flat, calm sea, but we're probably the fastest ship in the ocean in a very heavy sea. That stability lends to just a more comfortable ride in the ship. It's good for the people, it's good for the equipment, it's good for morale. The R. Lee Burke was the first American warship in many years to use this new hull configuration. Other warships, including those of most other navies, still retain the more traditional proportions. Operational experiences of the Burke class confirm the advantages of this new design. A fairly significant storm that had just come through, creating 18 to 22 foot waves. The escort ship that we had was a, a Knox class frigate. They could not physically go, th go through the area that we were in due to the high sea state, high winds, and just the rolling of the ship was creating a dangerous environment for the crew. Um, that's not to say that we wouldn't uh, eventually come to that point too. But in 22-foot seas, the ship is taking maybe 8 to 10 degree rolls and can maintain 20 to 25 knots indefinitely. And that's, uh, that's a lot more than a lot of other ships can take. Besides its unique hull shape, the Burke also incorporates other significant changes in naval architecture, one being a return to steel construction. Destroyers of the Second World War were made of steel. By the 1960s and 1970s, steel was being replaced by aluminum. The switch in materials was due to the increasing weight of radars and other sensors, high up in the masts which made the ships top-heavy. Aluminum was an excellent alternative to steel, since it offered strength at a lower weight. But it had its disadvantages in some respects, particularly in the case of battle damage and fires. The designers of the R. Lee Burke wished to return to steel construction and at the same time retain the many advanced electronic systems which have become essential to all modern warships. Well, what we've done on board R. Lee Burke was we've taken a lot of the vital spaces, taken them out of the superstructure, moved them down into the hull itself, and therefore we can afford to have steel topside. So you, you basically take your weight, relocate it from top down, and then you can afford to have more, more weight topside. Plus we've increased the beam of the ship so the ship won't be as top heavy or prone to rolls. It's a very stable platform on top of it. The Burke has a much more compact design than its predecessors. Its superstructure is sleeker and less cluttered than previous designs. And its architectural innovations make it more survivable in combat. The most obvious change in warship design since the Second World War is the physical impression of the ship. World War II destroyers bristled with guns. A typical destroyer would be armed with four or more turreted five-inch guns. And there would be dozens of smaller anti-aircraft guns. Burke destroyers seem to be nearly devoid of weapons. The only weapon immediately obvious is the five-inch gun on the bow. Appearances are deceiving, however, as these ships contain more effective firepower than any World War II warship. Burke-class destroyers carry a variety of missiles. SM-2 standard missiles for surface-to-air attack. Harpoon anti-ship missiles for over-the-horizon surface threats. VLA missiles for anti-submarine warfare and Tomahawk subsonic cruise missiles for land attack. Should any threats slip by the ship's missile defenses, Burke destroyers are also fitted with six torpedoes and two types of machine guns. The reason that the R. Lee Burke seems so barren of weapons is that they are hidden deep in the hull in the vertical launcher system. The vertical launchers consist of two launch cells, one in the bow and one in the stern, containing 90 missiles. 
guns and torpedoes were the primary armament of the World War II destroyer. But on Burke destroyers, missiles are the primary armament. Admiral Burke himself played a key role in this development, heading the Navy's research in the late 1940s when naval missiles were first being tested. Advanced sensors allow the modern destroyer to attack targets far beyond the reach of World War II destroyers. In the Second World War, destroyers could only engage targets they could see, typically less than 10 miles away. Its most powerful weapon was its torpedo. Today's destroyers can attack enemy ships over 50 miles away using anti-ship missiles. We have the Tomahawk weapon system, the TASM, Tomahawk anti-ship missile variant, uh, that can reach out quite a distance and be able to put a, a warhead on a ship. For a somewhat closer in action, but still over the horizon, we have the Harpoon cruise missiles, uh, anti-ship cruise missiles. Those are pretty common throughout the Navy. For close in action, I have the option of using my gun system, my five inch gun system, or I can use standard missiles in their surface to surface mode. Can also, of course, control aircraft, and the ship is designed to be part of a carrier battle group, so we can use carrier based aircraft, or for that matter, land based aircraft, and direct them to, con to conduct engagements for us. The Harpoon missile carried by the destroyer has been adapted for use by aircraft as well. It can be launched by the Navy's P-3C Orion, as well as the Air Force's B-52H Strato Fortress Bomber and the F-16 Falcon Fighter. The long reach of the Tomahawk adds an unprecedented level of firepower to the modern destroyer, enabling an attack on land targets hundreds of miles from the sea. Until the advent of the Tomahawk, the only tactical naval weapons capable of such range were carrier-based aircraft. This ability was used with great effectiveness in the 1991 Gulf War. One of the first weapons that arrived uh, in Iraq was a cruise missile launched off of an Aegis cruiser. That kind of capability to project power ashore hundreds of miles with great precision, uh, that's a wonderful capability and once again I think it lends to the balance and flexibility of this class of ship. The array of missiles in the vertical launchers can be changed depending on the Burke's mission. In the event of a hostile air attack, the Burke can launch the standard air defense missile. The standard missile provides protection against aircraft and cruise missiles at distances unimaginable in World War II. Radar guides the standard to its target, even if the target is moving near supersonic speeds. The standard forms the first layer of the air defense belt around the ship, reaching out dozens of miles. The final layer of defense against enemy anti-ship missiles comes from the close-in weapon system, or SeaWiz. SeaWiz provides us an anti-ship missile defense. We try to engage at the furthest distance. If those break down and somebody happens to sneak through, the close-in weapon system will come into effect there. It's fully automated. It uh, contains its own uh, search and tracking radars. Basically, uh, you can turn the system on and uh, walk away from it, and it'll protect the ship. On the rear deck of the destroyer is a landing pad incorporating LAMPS Mark III electronics for coordinated anti-submarine helicopter operations. The helicopter is a significant addition to the combat capabilities of a modern destroyer. Helicopters extend the range of the destroyer, allowing it to seek out and attack enemy ships and submarines dozens of miles away. One of the few criticisms of the DDG-51 was its lack of a helicopter hangar to permit the helicopter to be permanently stationed aboard ship. This was due to the Burke's compact size. 
newer Burke-class destroyers, designated as Flight 2 ships, were lengthened and substantially reconfigured to incorporate a helicopter hangar facility. These ships can carry two SH-60BR Seahawk helicopters. Carrying the LAMPS Mark III advanced electronics system, the Seahawks can be vectored by the Burks to conduct anti-submarine attacks or target over-the-horizon surface ships. For all the sophisticated radar and sonar-directed weapons on board, there still remains a place for the destroyer's traditional weapons, the torpedo and the gun. Torpedoes have been reduced in importance to last-ditch weapons against submarines. Missiles have taken their place in battles with enemy ships. The gun, once the mainstay of destroyer weaponry, is now used mainly for shore bombardment. The impressive array of traditional and advanced weaponry gives the Berg substantially more firepower than its World War II antecedents. combat power of a ship can no longer be judged by its weapons alone. Far more critical are its electronic sensors. These sensors allow it to accurately detect a target at long range and then direct the weapons to destroy it with pinpoint accuracy. During World War II, Admiral Burke was among the pioneers of these new sensors, using some of the first naval radars to come into use. On the Burke-class destroyers, the most prominent electronic sensors are for the Aegis radar system, far more advanced than the primitive naval radars of World War II. The Aegis radar is a phased array radar. Unlike traditional radars which rotate to look for targets, the Aegis is electronically steered. These four flat panels give the Burke 360 degree coverage every second. The speed and accuracy of Aegis allow for a high degree of automation. We have a very highly automated computerized system so we can take advantage of a rapidly developing scenario that we can respond very, very quickly. And in a highly automated computerized system like the Aegis weapon system, we can detect, track, and engage an incoming threat very quickly. Traditional role for destroyers is anti-submarine missions. As in the case of air defense, the essential ingredient in this mission is its electronic detection system. Located under the bow of the ship, the sonar is the key sensor in submarine hunting. On the bow of the ship is the SQS-53 Charlie sonar, a very high power, multi-frequency, multi-path type of active sonar. And so we have a great active capability to send active sonar transmissions out to, to listen for a return and find out where that submarine is. On the after part of the ship is a very sophisticated towed array passive sonar system that we trail behind us almost a mile behind the ship. And so we can put that down at various depths of water. So if a submarine is running deep, we can put our sensor down deep to listen for it. So it's a terrific one-two punch. A destroyer in World War II was usually on its own in collecting data on enemy positions. Today the Burke receives data from many sources, including satellites, surveillance aircraft, and other ships in the battle group. Critical data can be beamed around the world over digital data channels, linking surface warships operating anywhere in the vast expanses of sea. We will link with a number of different platforms that are in the battle group. It could be other ships in the area um, or other ships even over the horizon. Uh, they'll send us the information that they have. We'll send them the information that we have so you get one overall combined picture. We can use a helicopter on board for that, that exact same thing also. Send the helicopter out over the horizon, talk to have him come up to an altitude where we can see him and he can transmit his information back to us. We'll get his entire picture. That way we get one combined overall picture of what's going on around us. 
In decades past, the captain fought from the bridge of the destroyer. Today, the enormous flow and convergence of data from its advanced sensors and the need to coordinate the destroyer's actions with other components of the battle group means that the captain will fight the ship from deep in its hull in the Combat Information Center, or CIC. From there, a Burke-class destroyer can use not only its own weapons to attack an enemy target, but the weapons of other ships and aircraft of the battle group. This flexibility is made possible by the advanced command and control features of modern warships. Destroyers have traditionally been capable in all mission areas. Even uh, Admiral Burke's Desron 23 destroyers were capable in air and certainly capable in surface. That's uh, where their most famous track record was in, and ASW. Uh, with DDG-51 USS Arleigh Burke, what you're getting is a destroyer that's capable in all mission areas, but it's perhaps uh, more capable than other ships in all mission areas. For all their technological differences, the modern destroyer plays much the same role as its World War II ancestor, including air defense, surface attack, and anti-submarine warfare. As the threats to surface warships have changed, the destroyer has adapted to meet them. Today, the modern destroyer remains the workhorse of the Navy.